Oh. See, a just world is a sane world. There was nothing sane about Chernobyl. This is the science show. I'm pleased to report that the situation in Chernobyl is stable. In terms of radiation, I'm told it's the equivalent of a chest x-ray. No, Chernobyl is on fire. And every atom of uranium is like a bullet, penetrating everything in its path. Metal, concrete, flesh. Now Chernobyl holds over three trillion of these bullets. Some of them will not stop firing for 50,000 years. Tell me how to put it out. You are dealing with something that has never occurred on this planet before. From the series Chernobyl, see it and quake. But it is yet another example, like climate denial, of authorities refusing to acknowledge nature and physics. And here in Australia, as you know, we have an inquiry into the future of nuclear as an option going on in a world facing climate crisis. Jerry Thomas is Professor of Molecular Pathology at Imperial College in London. My first question, have you seen the series Chernobyl? I've only seen the first episode, I'm afraid. I haven't seen the whole series yet. And what did you think of it so far? I'm afraid it took me three hours to watch because I kept stopping it and writing down all the inaccuracies. That many inaccuracies, do you think? Yeah, there were lots of nuances about what radiation might be doing, which actually weren't correct. And other things like opening a door with a fire behind it with your bare hand and your bare hand not suffering the consequences. So there were lots of little things like that that I picked up in the first one. And unfortunately, I haven't had time to go back and watch the rest of it. Well, it's going to take you practically a week to go through the rest. It probably will, but hopefully I'll get less sensitised as I go through. Well, the first question about Chernobyl really is the description discrepancy between the number of deaths, which some people say is 57 deaths, and the thousands from other yeah. sources. What is your opinion? Well, if I quote from the UNSCEAR documentation, which is the stuff that we've gone through and looked at everything we could possibly do, looked at all the scientific evidence, there are about 134 people who had acute radiation syndrome, and those are the people who had the really high doses. We know 28 of those died within a few weeks to months after the accident. There are many of that cohort still alive. Some of them have subsequently died as the cohort ages. Obviously, these were people sometimes in middle age, so you would expect some of them to die anyway from natural causes. Some of those deaths have been related to driving cars or alcohol or cigarette smoking. But we couldn't pinpoint another death in that cohort that was actually due to the radiation. So that's the high dose. Then you have to look at the effects on the general population, where the doses are much lower and due to isotopes like radioiodine, 131 iodine, and cesium-137. And so those exposures have led to an increase in thyroid cancer in young children. Only in children, and we know if we give iodine to older people, we don't get thyroid cancer, even if we use a higher dose of iodine. And that's simply because the thyroid isn't growing so much and the doses to children are larger because they drink contaminated milk. But we know in the children who were exposed, those who are under, under 19 in exposure, we've had about 15 deaths from thyroid cancer. We think approximately 5,000 of thyroid cancer cases are in excess because obviously there is a natural background of thyroid cancer which has to be taken into account and that increases as that cohort ages as well during natural life. But we think about 5,000 excess cancers we've already seen and the estimate from the WHO was we'd probably see about 16,000 thyroid cancers by 2065. Now, of those, we would expect very few to die from their cancer simply because thyroid cancer is very easy to treat, ironically, with very high doses of ID-131. So we would estimate about a 1% death toll overall from thyroid cancer caused by the radiation. So if the 16,000 is right, we would reckon we'd see a total up to about 2065 of 160 deaths, possibly. Have you been to Chernobyl? 
I have been working with people in Ukraine, Belarus and Russia since 1992. I've not actually been to the power plant. My Ukrainian colleague is going to arrange for me to go. The only time I actually had all the permissions to go, when it was a lot more difficult to go, unfortunately the road was washed away. They had torrential rain and I couldn't actually go. Um, Now it's a lot easier to go. And there are some people living in areas which seem to be at risk. How are they getting on, do you know? Many of them are absolutely fine. Many of them have returned to where they used to live. They used to live on their own family farms, and a lot of them wanted to go back and work there. There's not so many young people because, obviously, there's not so much industry there because nobody wants to invest in the area. But they're fine. They're living off the land, so they are eating some food that still has a residual amount of contamination, but not that much, not as much as people think. And we know that cesium actually doesn't give you a very high dose of radiation to the body. It's simply because it has a longer half-life, physical half-life, and a short biological half-life. So it doesn't actually emit very much radiation while it's in your body. And the doses over about 20 years are about the same as one CT scan. So you can see why, if the doses are that low, you're unlikely to see anything increasing in the population at large. Indeed. Well, Chernobyl was, whatever the um, series indicated, a mucker, a real mess. It was an industrial accident of horrendous proportions, and it wasn't managed correctly. I think we can say that for certain. And Fukushima is quite different. What have we learned briefly from Fukushima and that accident? Actually, what we've learned from both accidents is evacuation actually kills more people than the radiation does because of the stress of evacuation and inappropriate medical care why people who were ill were being evacuated. In Fukushima, it was a totally different accident. There was very much less radiation released and the Japanese did exactly the right thing. They cut the food chain very quickly. So they stopped um, sources of contaminated milk and contaminated green leafy vegetables. And that reduced the concentration of iodine getting into the population. So they did exactly the right thing. And it's highly unlikely, as I'm a scientist, you can never say never, but it's highly unlikely we will see anything as a result of the Fukushima accident. But a lot of people are very scared that we will see something, and that obviously is affecting their daily lives. To live in fear is not a nice way to live. Not at all. How do you keep or watch effectively on that sort of thing? Well, there are an awful lot of health studies that are going on. They started a huge health survey as soon as they could after the Fukushima accident. So they're monitoring the whole population there. They're monitoring their health. And we are starting to see an awful lot of stress-related problems coming out. Nothing to do with radiation, but to do with the fear of radiation. We have an inquiry into the future of nuclear energy in this country. We don't have any. We have only got one small reactor for Mm -hmm. medical purposes, as you probably know. You've been to Australia several times. I've been three times, yeah. And if you were to give advice, you may already have given advice to the minister and the parliament, what would you say about the future of nuclear power as an option, given the new technology there is around these days? Well, I would say it's probably, if you look at all of the evidence, it's the safest technology to generate energy effectively. It's very energy dense so that you only use a small amount of your land mass and if you're interested in climate change actually it's the way to go because it's carbon neutral and we have a problem in that it's not just Australia and the UK, it's everybody else emitting CO2 as well which is causing the problems and there's a lot of evidence that if you look at those countries that are producing green clean electricity they are either the ones that have masses of hydropower which is an accident of geology or they are those that have combined hydropower with something like nuclear. Renewables don't seem to do it all of the time, and it does look as if you combine nuclear with hydro or some renewables, that's your best bet. It really depends on each country and what they want to do. If your listeners would like to have some fun, there's an electricity generation app that you can download, and you can look at all the countries that are producing electricity throughout a whole year, and see who is green and who is not. And I'm afraid Australia doesn't look very good on that. Oh dear, why not? Uh, the UK isn't brilliant either. Well, mainly your power is coal. Yes. And coal is one of the dirtiest and most CO2 emitting ways right. of producing electricity. Is each stage more or less safe, in your opinion, nuclear Yes, it is. Um, I mean, things are very heavily controlled with the nuclear industry. In fact, some people would argue too heavily controlled from what we know about the likely risks. But if you look at the data on electricity generation, nuclear has far less illnesses associated with it than anything else, including solar and wind. So it really is the safest way to go. But it's up to the Australian public to make their decision. And I think every country needs to look at their own energy mix and decides for itself because 
various different mixes are better for different countries. So what is your own research these days? into this area? My own research is really trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that are involved in generating thyroid cancers and is there's anything special about the way radiation does it. So far we can say that these tumours that we see in the children look and behave exactly the same as thyroid cancers in children of the same age arisen for other reasons. So it does look as if actually there's nothing special about the way radiation induces these tumours. And I'm still waiting for the results of a very big study from the US where they've done an entire genome search to see if we really can spot even minute differences between tumours induced by radiation and those not by in- induced by radiation. And what about common radiation, irrespective of the nuclear industry? There's plenty in rocks, there's some in Brazil nuts, and so it goes on. Yeah. How much you, you can't do, are we surrounded it. by? Yeah, we're absolutely surrounded by it. Everything you drink and eat is, has got a small amount of radiation. Even swimming in the sea, you're exposed to uranium. So we can't avoid radiation. And in fact, if our bodies couldn't deal with low doses of radiation, we wouldn't be here as a species. So we've evolved mechanisms that enable us to deal with low-dose radiation. Repair mechanisms. So repair mechanisms, yes. I mean, radiation is not the only toxin we're exposed to. It's just one toxin of many. So we do have these repair mechanisms for a reason. I'm more concerned about chemical carcinogenesis and radiation carcinogenesis because from all the literature that we've got, it looks as if actually radiation is a pretty poor carcinogen. It doesn't cause cancer to the extent that people think it does. But we seem to have a fixation and a fear about it, possibly because we can't smell it and we can't taste it. And we've grown up with a fear that I think wasn't helped by development of atomic weapons and things like that. But we really need to look at it again because if that's what's stopping us moving forward with nuclear power, we are likely to do ourselves more damage from the effects of climate change and and certainly more health effects from climate change than we would be from using nuclear power. So we, we really need to get our thinking gaps together and work out what really does radiation do to us and should we be scared of it, being that we're surrounded right the whole time. And 50% of your radiation comes from the rocks. You can't avoid it. And how much comes from coal? Actually, if you live near a a coal-fired power station, it emits three times as much radiation as a nuclear power station in normal operation. Quite difficult to take in, but that's what the, the science tells us. Interesting. As well as other toxic compounds like methyl mercury and things like that. So coal really is the villain. Coal is the villain. It produces particulates as well, which get into the lungs. And we have loads of evidence to suggest that particulate emissions, particularly in big cities like London, are causing an awful lot of respiratory illness among people, which is not pleasant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry Thomas, who is Professor of Molecular Pathology at Imperial College in London. And this is The Science Show on RN.